Today is Wednesday, October 8, 2014, the 281st day of the year. There are 84 days remaining until the end of 2014. On this day in 1871, four major fires break out on the shores of Lake Michigan in Chicago, Peshtigo, Wisconsin, Holland, Michigan, and Manistee, Michigan, including the Great Chicago Fire and the much deadlier Peshtigo Fire. In Chicago, where the center of the fire there is generally accepted to be the O'Leary's Cow Barn, Patrick and Catherine O'Leary, Irish immigrant family, the city center burns up three and a third square miles. The heart burned right out of it. A hundred thousand residents lose their homes, flee for their lives. Peshtigo in the Wisconsin Northwoods, that's Paul Bunyan territory, lumberjack country, where the industry moves when the Northeast is clear cut played out. Peshtigo, for its size and the enormity of loss, the town entire consumed in a firestorm hotter than a crematorium, fed by a paper-dry forest and strong winds fanned by the shifting cold front lake effect, maybe 2,500 souls swept away that town of Peshtigo and any surrounding village, scorched from the face of the earth, all in one day. The same day as that Port Huron fire, another big one in Holland, Michigan, and another in Manistee across the bay. The Peshtigo horror, as it came to be known, characterized by a massive wall of flame reaching as much as a mile high, whipped and goaded on by gale force winds. Monster, fire, tornado, so awesome and all-consuming, survivors want to believe the fires all around the lake started by a meteor shower or a massive attack of heat lightning. In 1833, fringe scientist, deep thinker, U.S. Congressman from Minnesota, Ignatius L. Donnelly, theorizes the simultaneous Michigan fires on this day were no coincidence, but the result of a meteor shower, fragments of a disintegrating comet falling to Earth around Lake Michigan, evidenced by pre-fire sightings in the western sky of the balls of fire traveling eastward at tremendous speed. And if you believe that, he's got a book about the lost continent of Atlantis, a great flood, and the extinction of the woolly mammoths caused by near collision of a great comet and Earth 12,000 years gone by. Chicago burns first, Saturday night, October 7, 1871, but on the west side of Green Bay on this day, more than 3,900 square miles, that's 2,500,000 acres, burn up in Michigan. Not only is the land burnt, left barren, thousands of buildings, houses, barns, stores, mills, destroyed, with no lumber left to rebuild. Hundreds of families left homeless. The total extent of property loss, animal deaths, forest devastation, unknown. In Chicago, the fire's origin, not so otherworldly. Reporter Michael Lahern wrote that story about Catherine O'Leary's cow getting fussy during her evening milking, kicking over a lantern into the straw. We love that story. What's more, we believe that story. Only problem is, it's not true. Years later, Ahern says he made it all up. Colorful copy. Another version still centers on the O'Leary barn, a local character, Daniel Pegleg Sullivan, who first reports the fire. He starts the fire while he's in the act of stealing milk from the O'Learys, drops a match from his cigar into the dry straw. Probably, doubtless, a little stinko. Third version, again, in the barn with the cow. The Chicago Tribune and a historian, Anthony D. Bartolo, suggests one Louis M. Cohen, not Irish this time, is in the barn gambling a dice game with the O'Leary boys, roguish Dion, played by Tyrone Power, in Old Chicago, 20th Century Fox, 1937, and Honest Jack O'Leary, Don Amici. When Mrs. O'Leary, Catherine, comes out to the barn around 9 p.m. to chase the boys out of there, and in the confusion, that lantern just can't stay upright, gets knocked into the hay, and up goes the barn, then the city. A little bit of an ethnic stereotype in here, Louis Cohn stops mid-book, running for his life, to scoop up the money. 1942, at 89, he dies, Cohn does, rich and respectable, leaves a good chunk of his dough, 35K, as a bequest to the Medill School of Journalism at Northwestern University, along with his confession. It was me, Cohn says. I did it. Sorry for the trouble. On this day in 1967, guerrilla leader Che Guevara, captured in Bolivia. El Colonel Felix Ismael Rodriguez, also known as Lazaro, Max Gomez, Felix Ramos Medina, Felix Elgato, Cuban exile, works for us. Well, not us exactly. He works for Poppy Bush, George H.W. in the Central Intelligence Agency. Loves his work. He's a special activities division operative. Sounds like a social director on a cruise ship, but with weapons. Leads, well, leads a little strong. Rodriguez advises a team of 1,800 special forces. Bolivians, regular army, contract 
characters undercover as a Bolivian army major to hunt down and capture Che Guevara. Rodriguez says he wants Guevara alive, wants to take him to Panama for interrogation, but the Bolivian president has other ideas. Everybody has other ideas. Rodriguez keeps Guevara's Rolex wristwatch. One question here, why is a committed revolutionary Marxist wearing a Rolex wristwatch? Other than that it keeps good time when you're tramping around the mountainous jungles looking to overthrow the government. October 7 word arrives that Guevara and his guerrilla band are camped nearby in Euro Ravine, feasting on monkey and bat meat and smoking the local product. Morning of October 8, on this day, 1967, Rodriguez and the Bolivians surround Che and his crew. There's a firefight. Che is wounded, and when the Bolivians close in, he says, Don't shoot me. I'm Che Guevara and I'm worth more to you alive than dead. It wasn't that he didn't do a great job as Fidel's right-hand man during the struggle to oust Fulgencio Batista, or that after the Castro brothers take power, making the hard choices about who gets the firing squad, who gets hard time in prison. He becomes financial czar in Cuba. Well, not czar exactly, they're socialists. He's president of the National Bank, in charge of the treasury. He even signs the money with just his nom de guerre, Che. Everybody knows who he is. He's the guy on the posters, on the t-shirts. He wants to get back to what he loves best, camping out in the woods, harassing the man, fighting the power. It doesn't go so good in 1965 in Africa. There's a language problem, so Che decides Bolivia is where he wants to go next. He knows the territory. Guevara is taken late in the day, October 8, to the village of La Higuera, to a mud schoolhouse. He's defiant. He's strong, obviously in a lot of pain, having been shot through the legs. He asks to speak to the young teacher who works there, Julia Cortez, who's 22. He asks sir, how she can expect to teach a young student in such a cruddy schoolhouse when the leaders of her country are driving around in Mercedes automobiles. He says, that's what we're fighting for. The Bolivian president orders Che Guevara's execution. Biographer John Lee Anderson writes that a volunteer, Sergeant Mario Terran, 31, alcoholic, says he'll do it because his three friends, coincidentally all of whom are named Mario, are all killed fighting with Guevara and his crew. Alone with Terran inside the schoolhouse, Guevara tells the sargento, I know you have come to kill me. Do it. Terran points his M1 at Guevara's chest, but hesitates. Che spits at his executioner. Shoot me, you coward, he says. You are only going to kill a man. During the morning hours before he's killed, one of the Bolivian soldiers who's guarding him asks Che if he's thinking about his mortality. Che says, I'm thinking only about the immortality of the revolution. Argentinian-born Cuban revolutionary Ernesto Che Guevara writes, Man truly achieves his full human condition when he produces without being compelled by the physical necessity of selling himself as a commodity. From Rutland, Vermont, this is Richard Alcott speaking.